hands that's warm like the summer sun. Conjure up the courage we need to create solutions for our homeland, our, 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 our Africa. With our courage, we will innovate for our time. We will raise up a new generation of independent actors who, with us, will build a new tomorrow. We, we won't, won't wait. wait. We won't run. We'll do it ourselves. We are hashtag DIY Africa. Welcome to hashtag DIY Africa. Presented by the Civic Tech Innovation Forum and GemFest. Jason, over to you. Oh, hello and a warm welcome to the Civic Tech Innovation Forum and JamFest. Thank you for joining us from all across the globe for this year's conference under the hashtag DIY Africa theme. My name is Jason Bygate. I'm a senior partner at Capacitate Social Solutions and co-host of the Talking Tech for Good podcast. Today, I'm excited to be facilitating this session titled African hashtag DIY Civic Tech Approaches. And in this session, co-hosted by CTIN and Jam Lab, in partnership with the Bertha Center, we're bringing together a panel of civic tech innovation stakeholders and operators in different regions of the African continent to discuss their key governance issues and the tools applied to enhance transparency and accountability using technology. Now that we've uh, properly welcomed you, I just want to cover a few housekeeping rules, if I may. Um, firstly, if you can, Please share and tweet today's conversation on social media using the hashtag um, JamFest and hashtag DIYAfrica. Um, all attendees uh, coming in, please note that you'll be muted um, and please feel free to use the Q&A function um, on the Zoom platform at any time or to post your questions in the chat function. Uh, we're really hoping to make the session as interactive as possible and would welcome your comments as we're progressing through the panel discussion. 
Uh, just to note as well that this does not have a French interpretation for this particular session. And as you are aware, this session is being recorded so that we can make it publicly available on our various digital platforms in the various formats. So with that out of the way, um, I think uh, we'd like to start just by introducing our panelists for the, for the session today. Unfortunately, we have had some um, panelists drop out of the session. Uh, we do have um, Omar Bakari, who unfortunately could no longer join us due, due to a bereavement in his family. So our thoughts are with him at this time. Um, and also, unfortunately, Munya Blogger from the uh, Magaba Network missed his flight, so he wasn't able to join us either. Um, but I'm sure that we have more than enough to talk about in the sessions today. So let me get on and introduce some of our other panelists that are joining us. Uh, firstly, we have um, Abigail, Abigail Selman, a senior associate at um, Ideas 20, uh, 42. Sorry, let's not downgrade you by a, a few a few um, points. Um, Abigail is the face of Ideas 2442 in South Africa, and she works on um, to design innovative behavioral solutions for challenges in global health and governance. Next, we have uh, Alexander, who, as we were discussing a little bit earlier before the session started, is the founder and executive director of the Digital Road Society. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be able to discuss a bit more about the, the, the origins of that name as well. And then finally, we have uh, J.D. Botma, who is head of products at OpenUp, and uh, looking forward to also digging into the origins of, of that organization as well. So just to give some, some background in terms of the, the, the session itself, we're going to run through some presentations by each of the speakers and then progress into a, a panel discussion where we're hoping to dig into some of the key aspects that would speak more specifically to uh, the issue of um, governance and um, transparency and accountability using, using technology and how we can, we can all benefit from the experience of the panelists and start to drive more of those DIY solutions across Africa. So without too much further ado, I think we'd like to just hand over to Abigail um, to start the, the, the sessions off um, and certainly to, to supplement my, my poor introduction of your many virtues. Um, but yeah, thanks to, to Abigail and um, I'll hand over to Abigail just to, to kick us off. Oh, I'm muted. Thanks so much, Jason, for the introduction. Can everyone see my slides, the, the correct version of them? <laughs> Great. Yeah, I see you good. nodding. Um, so I guess by way of intro to Ideas 42, maybe a quick little anecdote that we are not Ideas 24. And I feel like this is probably maybe the correct audience to share our origin story with is that we're named after um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but in the movie and the book, they ask, you know, what is the answer to the universe and life? They ask the supercomputer this question, hoping that they'll hear an answer and be able to take this into their life moving forward. And the computer gives the answer that the meaning of the universe and life is 42. Um, so that is where our name comes from. And I guess the moral of that story and how we use it is that you have to ask the right questions in order to understand the answers correctly. So we're all about asking the right questions at our organization. Um, so I'm going to speak today about how we use behavioral design to improve the effectiveness of civic technologies. Um, so I, Ideas 42 is a nonprofit behavioral design lab. So we're not actually a technology developer or implementing organization, um, but we apply behavioral design to solve social issues all over the world, working in partnership with other nonprofit organizations and governments. Um, so we have staff based across four continents, including Africa. Um, and here we have staff in Ghana, Senegal, Kenya, and I'm based in Cape Town. And in our work, we use behavioral science or the body of research into human behavior from across academic disciplines, such as psychology and economics, to understand why people do what they do and build innovative solutions based on this understanding to drive social change. So how can we use this approach to design more effective technologies? Um, well, we know that we design products for people as we understand them. And typically and very generally, 
individuals and organizations usually think about designing for humans in two ways or designing for two types of humans. First, we think about people as a Spock-like character, you know, someone who's totally rational and weighs all the costs and benefits of their decisions. Or we think about designing for Homer Simpson, um, the impulsive human. We assume people have no control over their behavior and we design with that in mind. But behavioral science says that re in reality, we're all somewhere in between this spectrum of caricatures. Um, so in this example, people know the bridge is there and they know it might keep them safe from oncoming traffic. So sometimes they use it, but also sometimes it seems like a hassle to walk around to the entrance of the bridge um, or they might be in a hurry, so they take a shortcut instead. So we think about designing for this type of person. And in this way, behavioral science offers a new approach and a new way of thinking about how we can design civic technologies by helping us understand how seemingly trivial features of the environment, such as the time of day or the way choices are displayed, influences users' behavior. And using behavioral design, we attempt to reshape these environments in a way that supports users in using the technology as we intended. So at ITS42, we follow a pretty specific methodology for how we do this. And you can all think about applying this to your work in ways as well. Um, so we work with partners who have a specific goal in mind. For example, to design a technology that people use as they've intended it to be used and that has a certain impact. But our partners often come across a challenge that users aren't making decisions or taking actions as they've expected when they design the technology or as the technology is intended. So we then draw on the behavioral science literature and our observations of the context to consider how the environment may influence users' decisions and actions. And then we use that understanding to develop low cost and light touch tweaks to technologies that reshape environments. So I'm gonna share a couple examples of how we have done this in practice. Um, the first example is from work we did with Open Up actually, and I'm so excited that JD is here to share um, some of his work with you as well. Um, so our, in our work with Open Up, um, their goal was to design a mobile platform to help South African youth engage in local policymaking. And they wanted to understand what might prevent youth from engaging in the policymaking process, even with the information that was provided to them on this platform about how to engage. So we conducted a literature and spoke with youth. Um, and we learned that um, although um, most South African youth um, speak a different language at home, most formal channels for participation were still conducted in English. And so what this was doing was sending an implicit social signal to these individuals that maybe participation wasn't for them, but it was for people who speak English. So our recommendation to open up was, you know, that although they can't change how municipalities conduct these um, participation channels, that maybe they can send a different social signal to you to tell them that they um, are wanted to engage in, in these participation channels simply by enabling youth to access the platform in whichever language they preferred. So here's one way we suggested they might do that. The second example I'll share is from work we did with the city of Cape Town to help improve how they responded to municipal service requests. Um, so they wanted to improve the way that the city responded to these requests submitted by constituents online. But the challenge they were facing was that constituents were often entering incorrect information about these requests on the platform. And what we learned from our exploration was that constituents were unable to differentiate between similar types of requests that were riddled with municipal government jargon. So for example, um, constituents struggle to differentiate between submitting a request about a burst pipe and a block sewer. Both of those things spill water onto the street and constituents couldn't tell the difference. So we designed a solution for this platform um, where we simply showed constituents images of commonly confused request types and allowed them to select from an image instead of a dropdown. And this is what that looked like in practice. And, um, we ran a lab experiment to test whether or not this was effective, and we actually found that putting this pictures instead of just the categories led to a 25 percentage point increase in the number of requests that were submitted correctly. So just this small tweak based on insights from human behavior um, can save the city large amounts of time and resources. 
So those are just two examples, um, but I hope the key thing you'll take away from today is that drawing on a deep understanding of human behavior when designing technologies can really help make technology more effective and impactful. Um, so thanks so much for listening and I will look forward to your questions. Great, thanks so much, Abigail. I think some, some really important um, suggestions there. And, and I think also in, in looking at how you can apply a framework to the approach that you take when, it's, when it comes to technology. And I think certainly in my experience, that, that is definitely a step that uh, is often missing. Um, some organizations charge ahead in building out systems without really considering the context in which they're going to be deployed and also the users that are going to be using the system. Um, and that sort of top-down approach inevitably ends in tears um, with, uh, with a lot of money and time being wasted and uh, a piece of technology that sits on the shelf and doesn't add value. So I really appreciate your inputs and I think certainly some points to, to pick up when we get to the Q&A. Um, so just then moving on to, to JD, um, I'm just going to hand across to JD and, and uh, we can hear some more about the work that OpenUp does. Thanks, over to you, JD. Hi. Um, yeah, are you seeing my opening slide and hearing me? Yeah, cool. we got you. Great. So, so yeah, thanks. And, and I was just as excited to, to see Abigail here um, and uh, Siba for that matter. Uh, it's a it's a really cool um, group of people to to join here. Um, so, uh, uh, Open Up's vision: we're we're a civic technology organization uh, based in Cape Town, but we're working across uh, the country and 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 going going beyond the the borders uh, now. Um, our vision is a South Africa where where citizens and government are empowered to thrive collaboratively. Um, which gives us a lot of freedom in, in what we're working on, but I think it also targets us very, very nicely in um, that interchange or this exchange. So a little bit of, about our context. Uh, we do both contracted projects where, for example, government or other organizations contract us to build something with them. Um, and often when it's government, it's around transparency, it's about access to information and public participation, like the, the project that uh, Abigail mentioned. Um, and sometimes there are grant funded projects and they also very much align, uh, well, then, then it's um, completely like whatever we want to do um, uh, aligned with our vision. But luckily our, our contracted projects also generally align really well to our vision. Um, and, uh, I, th I think I'm going to mention um, three projects quite briefly. This this first one is called Municipal Money, uh, and that's one we built for our national treasury, um, where we were contracted, and they had been collecting a whole bunch of information uh, for many years, um, but they they wanted to make that a little bit more accessible. Um, they want people to be able to um, access this information without being an expert in municipal finances, in local government finances, and take something away and be able to hold their uh, local government to account. Um, and it was while we were building that, uh, and our process is generally a, a mixture of user-centered design and um, design thinking and so on. But while building that, um, that I realized that there's something that goes a little bit beyond this, this website that, that I need, um, which was to, to access sort of how these things are built. Um, so um, I've, I've been, I'm gonna share some really DIY stuff, some, some more like um, stuff where, where people are just hacking something together because they see the need themselves. Um, so while we were building this, this site for Treasury, I needed access to some of the, the formulas and the, um, the calculations of how those indicators should be calculated. Um, and this is the website where they used to publish all of this, and they still publish it, um, but this is sort of the, uh, just where they upload the Excel files and the PDF files and so on, as well as the, um, the memos that go out to local governments to tell them how they need to, to collect this information. Um, and I knew some of the explanations of how these things should be calculated was on this website, but this website for some reason isn't indexed by Google. Um, so I, I realized, well, I can scrape the entire site and that's what I did. I downloaded the whole website to my computer and I searched on my hard drive and I found what I needed. And I realized that there are probably a lot of other people um, who need to be applying these, these uh, calculations themselves working at one of the 256 municipalities um, in the country. Um, 
so I thought, well, this is this is an obvious gap, and other people can't just just download everything for themselves. So I set up a mirror website and just automated scraping and and building the site and try to make my site indexed by Google because trying to help the the treasury um, make this uh, indexed by Google wasn't really working very well. Um, and the idea with this website was that it would just be a, a, a verbatim copy of the site um, and drive traffic to the original site, but at least let people discover the content there. Um, and that was very effective. Um, I ended up for about three years getting around about 2000 visitors a, a month, which is um, one of the most successful websites I've ever built. Um, and you'll see it trail off there for some reason towards the end of um, of well yeah during this year uh, their site has actually now been indexed by google and i don't know if that's because google has finally realized there's this really popular site mine that's linking to theirs and therefore it's worth indexing them or, or what but um anyway the the important thing is that people can now access this the site and i've spoken to someone working at a municipality saying while they were doing their masters um in local government finances they were using my site quite quite a lot um, and for a, a technical person, this is a really, really simple thing. We're just collecting the information in a structured form and then making it available in a, in a way that's a bit more accessible. Um, the next project is, is called Keep the Receipts. Um, now, during the, the pandemic, quite, quite early on at this point, uh, we didn't realize how early it was at, at, at that stage, um, the National Treasury was publishing the information on uh, purchases by government uh, for, for personal protective equipment for COVID. And, but they were publishing it as PDF files, uh, which kind of makes sense if you know how they work, where someone needs to sign something off and it need, needs to be scanned and so on. Um, but it's really hard to, to sort of find the needle in the, of the information that you're looking for in that haystack. If you're an investigator journalist, if you've got 100 PDFs to work from. So the idea with Keep the Receipts was just to make a slightly smaller haystack. So you can just hone in on the, the little bit of information you need. Um, and even if you still have to do a lot of manual processing there. But to get the data into a database from those PDFs, um, we turned to a, a community of uh, technologists on ZA Tech, the links in the bottom there. Um, and ask them for help. And we had a hackathon and got a whole bunch of people together and outlined just a, a set of instructions of the structure we want. Um, and we pretty quickly got really far in, in collecting this information. Um, and this community has been really, really awesome, actually. So the, the, the final project I want to touch on is um, called Seeking Shelter. And this is an example of a project where someone from our community we weren't involved in this at all other than running this um, this meetup group codebridge um, where someone who has contact with um, people working at uh, shelters for for women who are at risk of abuse um, knew that they have this problem of being able to find these um, these shelters and also um, advocate for um, understanding where those, those shelters need to be improved um, so they, they got together, they met some technologists and um, built this map that shows where those shelters are with the location slightly offset so that people can, can find them nearby, but someone still has to verify that you really ought to know exactly where this is so that someone who wants to cause harm can't just find the, the shelter where, where the person they want to harm is. Um, and um, and they also overlaid some statistics on sort of where the, the biggest need is for, for these kind, kinds of shelters. So I think that's, that's probably mostly just a lot of information about projects. Uh, I think we'll dig into the, the how and, the, and so on. But I want to leave you with, with one main point, which is to collaborate and not to silo. Um, so if you're a technologist, to find a domain expert, uh, to find a designer, uh, to find someone who knows Excel, and to experiment together, um, because I think, uh, and I think it relates to, to the, the point in the previous one where um, we really can uh, make some bad choices if we're not talking to people. And if 
uh, there's an idea from the startup world that you're not at risk of losing your idea by talking to people about it uh, because you're already ahead by having this idea and by having these conversations. Um, so that's not going to be an issue. Um, don't, don't sort of keep your idea a secret. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, JD. I think that's great. Certainly the, the point about collaboration um, across the, the development sector, I think really the only way to solve the problems on the scales that we have to is through collaboration. Um, and certainly for me, technology is one of the best ways to, to achieve that collaboration, either in talking about technology and finding solutions together, um, or in using technology to bring organizations and people closer together when they are solving those problems. Um, and certainly that, that, that notion of reaching out to, to your community is, is really um, a, a good one. Um, and certainly accessing the, the resources that you can um, provide you with um, a lot of potential to improve the ideas that you might have or to test them to see whether or not they're viable. But thanks really much, very much, uh, JD. Really appreciate that. I'm going to hand over to, to Alexander. Um, but before that, I'd, uh, I'd just like to welcome our, um, our fourth speaker, um, Nelson um, Olipekan from is the founder and team lead of Citizens Gavel. Um, Nelson, who is uh, currently branded as the hashtag DIY Africa panelist, uh, has joined us a little bit later. Unfortunately, he did have a, a clash in his diary, but I'd just like to welcome Nelson. Um, so nice to have you, Nelson. And um, I'll, I'll uh, give, you a, give you a chance to say hello, and then I'll hand over to Alexander. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nelson here. Yeah, uh, apologies. I, I guess I missed up the, the timing. I, I, I thought it was uh, yeah, supposed to be one thirty. I was logged in one thirty. I felt it was, when I got the update again, I thought it was going to be 2.30 and I was ready for 2.30. Never knew it was, it was so I, I really a big apologies there. But no, I, I heard that, um, so what we do in, in Davo is basically using technology, digital technology to um, accelerate the pace of justice delivery. And um, it was really uh, a big um, instrument during the latest NSAS movement, and hopefully I, I get to talk about that in the course of the of the program. So, yeah. Great. Well, nice to have you, Nelson. Um, yeah, we look forward to your presentation. Um, but yeah, welcome, welcome, and uh, happy to have you join us. Um, if I can then hand over to Alexander just to to guide us through the the the, the digital rogue environment. We look forward to hearing a bit more about uh, what what the rogues are up to to disrupt our dysfunction. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, I don't have a slide prepared, so I'm just gonna make a speech. So, Digital Rock Society uh, Experiment Group was uh, established like uh, almost two years ago now. It was established on December uh, 2019 as a local civil society organization and we are licensed by the interested organ and uh, the main uh, cause of this uh, organization to be established was we had another startup where we were working to establish a credit scoring company uh, startup credit scoring uh, business here in ethiopia however we couldn't uh, get uh, the policy support uh, from the interested organ so we had we had to resort to uh, any kind of outlets that can support uh, the policy advocacy activities. And uh, during that period, especially like two or three years ago, Ethiopia, Ethiopia is still and uh, have been in the process of transition. And uh, we are witnessing uh, several uh, debates, uh, disagreements over the digital landscape. And there was widespread uh, head speech and misinformation circulating, uh, especially on the digital landscape, which resulted in uh, creation of many chaos uh, in different parts of the country. So uh, personally, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I don't have that techno technology knowledge, but uh, I was surrounded by this uh, technology wizards, uh, marketing professionals, musicians, and we discussed 
uh, how we can uh, combat this challenge and uh, contribute our fair share in the development and democratization of our country. So we established uh, this experiment uh, group. So we, uh, we do not uh, provide, uh, we are not the sole providers of uh, civic technology, rather we opt to inculcate uh, different actors or different professionals, even lawyers, especially lawyers and uh, IT professionals to join our team uh, and uh, provide uh, different kinds of uh, civic technology products that could uh, enhance uh, transparency and accountability initiatives, uh, especially in the tech uh, business regarding to tech businesses and uh, government. So after a certain period of time, uh, we were uh, we approached a certain institution by the name Center for International Private Enterprise. It is a civic incubator located here in Addis. They have uh, different offices across the globe. And we approached them and uh, we became a partner. We received different uh, trainings from them, especially on advocacy. Uh, and that gave us uh, an exposure in regard to the civic space, uh, especially in, here in Ethiopia. And during that time, as I told you earlier, we Ethiopia is uh, in the process of transition and uh, the national election uh, electoral board of Ethiopia was restructured and uh, established by its own uh, proclamation. And uh, it made a call for civil society actors working in Ethiopia to provide proposals, uh, especially in the voter education area. And we uh, somehow framed uh, our proposal in line, in line with uh, our uh, mission, the organization. And uh, somehow we branded our initiative by the name Merch Ethiopia. Uh, it means vote Ethiopia directly. So Merch Ethiopia was labeled uh, because of this uh, thing. And we somehow established uh, uh, a website for it and also established uh, social media assets, uh, mainly Facebook, Telegram, Instagram, and Twitter. And uh, with that uh, website, people can access uh, election related contents, especially using animation uh, videos, uh, graphic designs, and written contents by employing two local languages, Amharic and Afan Oromo. And uh, they can also uh, access uh, political parties' manifesto, their uh, political party social media links, uh, contact details. And we also employed accessibility features so as to include uh, the interest, uh, so as to increase the interest and participation of uh, people with disabilities and first time voters as well as uh, women. And we have somehow managed to uh, get uh, more than, uh, our contents have reached more than 400,000 people within a period of uh, two, three months. And uh, even the National Electoral Board of Ethiopia was so supportive. They even uh, accredited uh, our, uh, activities, they even shared our contents, and that gave us uh, more exposure, uh, even to analyze the uh, election uh, ecosystem. And uh, moreover, uh, we were also licensed by the election commission to observe the political parties' online activities. And uh, that was a unique approach, uh, especially as a civil society organization. And uh, that allowed us to access, uh, especially most of, most of these political parties utilize uh, Facebook to disseminate their information. And we somehow, uh, from the participating or competing 46 political parties, only uh, 22 political parties use uh, Facebook to uh, engage with their audience. And we somehow uh, made parts, uh, 
of this uh, election period by making uh, three uh, categories. We have the pre-campaign period, the campaign period, and post-campaign uh, period. And we analyzed uh, their posts uh, by defining uh, the category and subcategories. And uh, that is uh, visualized in the data studio. Uh, and we produced a report. And that allowed us even uh, to see uh, the trends in the uh, in the election uh, landscape, how democratization is working in Ethiopia, uh, and even uh, political parties can also uh, scrutinize or monitor their uh, activities, and the government can also uh, see the trends. What are the uh, things happening? Uh, throughout the country, uh, even uh, by observing uh, the political parties' uh, online activity. And uh, this has been shared to the election commission and also to the political parties through uh, their uh, joint uh, political parties council. And uh, yeah, these are mainly the two uh, programs we are still engaged on because the uh, election is not uh, over here in Ethiopia. And uh, yeah, we are uh, currently uh, involved in uh, studying the... So here in Ethiopia, there are four pillar organizations uh, necessary for the advancement of civic engagement. One is the National Electoral Board of Ethiopia. The second is uh, Federal Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Third is the Ombudsman and fourth, the Human Rights Commission. So, uh, well, most of uh, the activities of the government as well as uh, interested stakeholders are geared to us, towards uh, realization of uh, peace throughout the country. And uh, so we somehow wanted to involve uh, ourselves in this discourse. And we have identified the Federal Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission to be our next uh, uh, stop. And we are currently involved in undertaking some research in order to support their uh, activities through civic tech products. And that's going uh, very much awesome. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Alexander. Um, I think for me, one of the things that that really um, sticks out is the um, the fact that you don't need to be a technologist to provide technology solutions. And uh, especially given there's uh, there's more and more accessible tech that you can that you can rely on and, and, and use to meet your requirements. I think that having that that uh, that sector expertise, but also I think bringing in diverse perspectives gives you a, um, a strong base to to provide solutions or so thanks very much alexander certainly look forward to discussing more on on the approach that you followed and um, and some suggestions as to how other organizations and individuals could uh, could follow that process to to achieve the sort of um, penetration and and coverage that you have so I'd like to now hand over to to Nelson. Um, hopefully, he can uh, can give us a, a bit more about uh, the work that he's doing, and um, uh, we can discuss uh, the the work that's happening in terms of the um, citizens' gavel. Um, before digging into the panel discussion, um, I have a few questions that I'd like to pose to the panel, and certainly look forward to to receiving your questions on the on the chat or on the the Q and A function. Nelson, can I hand over to you? Yeah, nice to meet. Uh, nice to speak again. Um, yeah, so at Citizen Gavel, what we basically do is accelerating the pace of justice delivery through access to justice, dignity, technology, and citizens' engagement. And those are the three main um, core pillars through which we and uh, through which we. Uh, profile solutions to our uh, issues. Now, our digital technology has 
uh, be able to, you know, improve the pace of justice delivery in Nigeria. Number one, uh, we have a solution we call PODUS. And PODUS is a, I often refer to it as, a, as Uber for justice, because people can easily relate when I call it Uber for justice. And um, what PODUS does is to connect victims of police brutality or rights abuse to lawyers, pro bono lawyers nearest to them. And um, what we do with produce basically um, became very important, especially during the NSAS, recent NSAS uh, movement in Nigeria where the issues of police brutality um, came, came to, to its eyes. And Podus and our other social media platform was instrumental to connecting various victims of rights abuse. In, in, in total, at the end of the NSAT, we were able to um, provide legal intervention in over 436 cases at the end of the NSAT um, um, protest in Nigeria. And these were cases from different levels of arrest, extortion, and um, extrajudicial killings, missing persons, and different issues like that. The other um, civic tech tool that we, I would like to also highlight is our Justice Club um, tech solution. So Justice Club majorly, what this does is a case is a case management software where yeah, it enables interaction between the major stakeholders in the criminal justice system. So um, in Nigeria, before a case can be um, trans properly transferred to the court, it will have to be sent to the Department of Public Prosecution for legal advice. So sometimes it takes a while in that department. And we have put, produce came in to help accelerate the process uh, of initiating legal advice and ensuring that there is an accountability within that structure of legal advice. So on, on average, prior to now, it, it may take between six months to two years before legal advice is issued. And these people within that timeline, they will be in prison oftentimes if they are not granted bail. And since they are in prison, that accumulates the number of awaiting trial persons, the trial detainees in Nigeria. But what produce try to do is to provide a, a software that could ensure that the, the legal advice is issued within the time frame. So in, in, in Nigerian law, you should issue legal advice within 28 days. That is what the law says, Administration of Criminal Justice Act. However, what is different from what is practiced? So what process is seeking to achieve is reduce that as close as possible to that 28 days timeline. And gradually we are getting there. But of course, you know, um, uh, the, the major um, challenge we've been facing is the issue of adoption. But of course, in many states that we've deployed, we've seen tremendous um, growth. I would have loved to show you some of these um, interface, but uh, since I, I don't have the control, uh, it's, it's a, okay, okay, I think I have a control now. So I will just quickly show you um, how, how produce, how we run produce. So this, this is like a sample case of one of the um, cases we run through produce. So you have this number of days. This is how long the case file has been with uh, the, the stakeholder, the government agency. 
are. And what this does is that it counts that time, how long it stays with that stakeholder. It keeps counting. So this draws attention, it spotlights how long the case and this person has been in detention or the case has been unattended to. So with this time, we are able to ensure that the um, head of each department can, can easily spotlight cases that are going beyond the statutory timeline and they could work on it as soon as possible. But what could produce, uh, what um, Justice Clause also helps to do is that it helps them to document, easily document these cases in a timeline order from the point of arrest to the point of arraignment in court and the like. So this is just a screenshot. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't really show you a live feed of police because is being run by government agency. So the data is that of government. But this is just a screenshot for presentation purpose. So uh, you, you wouldn't want me to be sued for leaking government <laughs> info. So, um, and um, the, this data, um, when it's documented within the system, uh, within the government, uh, um, server, it can easily be shared with um, the, the pro bono agencies when there is need be, uh, when there is need to do that. Also, it drives on accountability. Third, it helps to document all these cases. There have been cases of missing case files in some of these government agencies prior to now, and. What PODUS does is that it ensures that no one is left behind. No, no one, uh, no case file gets missing. I, I've, I've intervened in cases where a person has been behind bar for, ten, uh, for seven years because of missing case file. And because that case file, that's the old, that's your old, that's what can make or break you in the criminal justice process. If your case file is missing, then technically that, that um, defendant or um, uh, was the other name now, of course, in the technical word is defendant, but majorly people refer to them as criminal. That person is is uh, can 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 spend his own life in prison until that case file is found and is properly processed within the criminal justice uh, process. However, what produce does is to ensure that that such incident doesn't happen. A person's case file doesn't get missing because once it's, it's um, tied into the system, you you can easily be trapped your data can easily be extracted. And once you, um, it's traceable to human error, then solutions can be provided to, uh, to that issue. The other uh, civic tech tool that we also use that I mentioned earlier, pardon me, yeah, is Podus. So this is Podus. This is the live feed of Podus. And this one is managed directly by Dabo. And for, for, for people, they, they, they can come here and report cases, select the, the county, local government, or state, and you get linked to lawyers in your state. And we've helped a lot of people, you know, we've connected a, a whole lot of uh, victims of right abuse to lawyers. In our database, we have over 160 lawyers um, across 24 states. And with that, we are able to easily respond to issues of um, um, prolonged detention, extortion, and many of these um, rights abuse that is common in, in our 
uh, in, in the continent. At, at times, you know, some of the challenges that we also have to highlight is that internet penetration in Africa is not as much as you have in other countries like Europe. While a lot of young people use platforms like these, there are still some demographics that are not covered, that the people in the rural area that cannot access internet to connect to platforms like this. And what we do in that situation is we do physical on-site um, support to, to people in those demographics. So we go to the location to the rural um, um, environment, engage with them, provide phone numbers. So simple and low tech tools like phone numbers, SMS are provided to them. And the young people in those communities are also taught how to access platforms like this so that they can help the people that are not that literate in the event of, of rights abuse. And we've seen a lot of people reporting rights abuse on behalf of friends, families um, that, can, that don't have direct access to uh, platforms like this. Um, the other third thing that we do is uh, infographics. So we have simple infographics through which we, we educate people about laws in simple Nigerian laws that can really um, <clears throat> educate them about their rights. It takes someone that knows his rights to take legal action when such right is infringed on. So simple things tools like Gavel and we simplify or storyify those laws in such a way that is engaging and is creative. We pass it on to our social media platforms and people follow through, read through, and that stimulates questions. And there people remember that okay, I've been I've been in this scenario before. Can I? What can I do? So we provide legal advice to people on that. But where they need concrete legal action, we also follow up by assigning a lawyer to them, and they we we we, we go to court or if necessary, if necessary go to other dispute resolution platforms like mediation and arbitration panels on behalf of that. So these are some of the ways we've been using DIY civic tech tools to promote uh, good governance and promote Africa um, at large. Thank you. Thanks, Nelson. <clears throat> Um, I'm really excited that you've uh, you've touched on some key areas there for me, um, in particular around that issue of of urban versus rural and you know, navigating the um, the concerns around access. Um, and I'll, I always love references to to Uber and and I think huge huge benefit besides what the platform does, just in providing a reference point for um, using technology to democratize access. Um, and then also looking at how you can you can build sustainable models through technology that also um, helps to empower people on the ground. So thanks very much for that um, that discussion, Nelson. Certainly looks like you're doing some really interesting things. Um, I thought that we might uh, have a few more platforms to work through um, that are sitting under your 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 suite of solutions. So I, I think. For us now looking to move into the panel discussion, uh, just a reminder again, if you do have any questions for the for the panelists to post them either into the um, the chat function um, or into the Q&A function and we'll we'll try to um, address those through the panel. Um, but to start us off, I, I want to pick up on one of the points that that Nelson was making earlier and, and certainly to pose it to uh, the whole panel. Um, and that is one of the digital divide. So we're talking at approaches to, you know, to, to doing DIY in, um, in terms of civic tech. So 
really for me the digital divide is is one that um, certainly has become more evident in uh, through COVID-19 and we have this this rapid push towards digital migration many organizations are looking to see how they can um, provide their services virtually um, and having to migrate to a digital environment so I wanted to pose that question to you is is how do you navigate that that digital divide so that in building out technology solutions, you're not um, inadvertently excluding some members of, of society from access uh, to those technologies and the services that are delivered through that technology. So maybe I can start with uh, with with Abigail, um, given you've you've got a really um, robust approach to uh, to building out uh, technology and, and thinking about solutions. Yeah, sure. So I can give a couple of thoughts on this. Um, so as a behavioral scientist, there's not really a world in where we would facilitate more access to technology through building more technology systems or providing those to individuals in rural areas or developing Wi-Fi networks or things like that. But we would think about, you know, what are those barriers to people being able to access the technologies that do exist? And when building new systems for more people to access them, how can we make sure those systems are inclusive, they're equitable, and that people will actually be able to access them um, as well. So not just thinking about setting up the infrastructure itself, but also thinking about how can we really plug people into that infrastructure. And even in places where that infrastructure and access does exist, I mean, there's one thing to say that people have access, but it's another thing for people to actually access the infrastructure. So I think behavioral science could offer some insight into how to make sure that this digital divide is decreased um, in terms of accessibility and, and how people actually are able to use it. Thanks, Abigail. I think, yeah, you're also touching on a point about the, the, the multi-dimensional nature of the digital divide. Um, in some cases, it's not just about access. And I think Nelson also touched on the fact that sometimes you, you need help in navigating um, access to that technology and being able to leverage the technology once you have the access. So certainly there, there are multiple components to that, that digital divide. Um, JD, on, on, on your side, you also have um, a whole range of, of solutions, um, those that you've built. Um, what were the considerations when you were building out those solutions? Yeah, um, so I think what, what we are hearing in South Africa is that a lot of people have some level of, of internet access. I think smartphone, uh, Penetration is is really wide. Um, a lot of a lot of people have a, a device, um, but it it would be quite limited. And access to internet is extremely expensive. But by acknowledging that, I think it it helps us to think about what what is practical. And we don't have to go. I mean, we have done booklets. At, so designing something for offline first. When we talk about mobile first, you can go all the way to offline first. Um, and then that that off that that booklet could also be a PDF or something that or or a mobile responsive website. But uh, we also see that it's very effective to look at intermediaries, people who, uh, and especially activists, I think, are often organized in a way where someone has access to information or a lot of people have intermittent access to data um, to, to a Wi-Fi network or something. And then thinking about if we make information available, uh, if we're working on a transparency project, um, making it so that they can't just see it on a web page, but also download it as a PDF or, or something. Um, or down, make, not just put videos on YouTube, but make them downloadable in, in form, formats and sizes that, that are reasonable to download and then share e either by driving to the next town and showing that to people or sending it over Bluetooth. And we hear that from people who say in townships, they're so used to their phones being stolen that they, uh, they ensure that they synchronize their contacts to the cloud. Um, so that when their phone gets stolen and they eventually get a new phone, boom, their contacts are back, their calendar is back and things like that. Um, so people are quite savvy on that um, and, and that does provide them with a way of bridging that. Thanks, Teddy. Um, just going across to you now, um, Alexander, given that you're focused um, a lot on uh, things like elections and, and also public information, um, how would how is that that issue of connectivity navigated from your side? Is it something that you considered in the in the design process when you were putting together the the, the solutions that you provide? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jason. So uh, the issue of uh, internet connectivity, especially here in Ethiopia, 
it's very volatile and the data cost is very high, even though uh, many uh, somehow privatization is uh, somehow undergoing. But uh, we have managed to uh, consider this issue and we have opted uh, to uh, utilize uh, USSD and traditional medias uh, in order to reach uh, potential voters in order to consume our uh, contents. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, somehow the internet uh, interruption that was observed, uh, especially last year, uh, has been uh, seen has been uh, can be uh, say, can be said uh, can be said has been redressed somehow uh, significantly. Uh, some of the issues uh, regarding uh, for, uh, for the cause of uh, this interruption have been uh, addressed by the government, even though there are some uh, uh, points uh, that need still to be considered, but uh, most of it have been addressed. And we have uh, uh, utilized such approach uh, in order to reach uh, potential waters. Okay, fantastic. And I think going, just coming back to you again, um, Nelson, I know you mentioned that you, you also made use of some, some low tech solutions to, you know, to try and bridge some of the, the gap that you experienced. Um, I think that the, you know, the issue of data costs is one that's, uh, that's fairly universal across the continent. But I just wondered if you had any particular insights around using um, low tech um, to supplement the, the, the technology solutions. Uh, so we, we, have, we have to note different economic demographics of our users. And um, in building that, that was why we provide alternatives. So if you, you, if you are not restricted to use the platforms alone. You can use the phone, phone, phone call services, you could use the SMS services. And what, and of course, at times, um, people leverage on, on, on social network. Now, what I mean by social network is not really the, the Facebooks, the, the Twitter, but on, on friends and family to reach out to, to that uh, support, the needed legal support, as the case may be. So those broad spectrum of, of alternatives helps us to, to nav navigate and bridge uh, and really provide that democratization uh, we're talking about. Um, the, the, the young people in Nigeria are really tech savvy, but the, the older demography are not a tech savvy. And also people living in the rural area, you can't compare their literacy level with people living in, in urban areas. So this um, broad spectrum of alternatives helps us to target that uh, different demography um, really. Um, even at times, we've seen situations where people you know, have internet, this month they don't get to have internet the other month so you, you have to provide that alternative for them but one thing that was really really noted that worked so well is the fact that people are uh, are their neighbors uh, really uh angels of support because even in the event of police brutality a victim cannot really be the one calling you know for support you need someone that is like a friend or like a witness to that scenario to really provide that uh, calls call call um, put that call through or go into the app and, and, and log on to the app and, and reach out so that that has just been the methodology and the strategy we've really leveraged on yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for, the, for that. I think that certainly it's 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 good to hear that there's you know there there's a lot of common areas and um, 
firstly in the context that we're trying to navigate um, across the continent and in, in facing similar challenges, but also in the way that we're navigating around those challenges. Um, and certainly that that uh, that function of of leveraging um, intermediaries and um, and also low tech solutions um, and also giving the users credit for for finding ways to to get access. I think from a South African context, the the cost of data I think remains a consistent barrier, and um, even with the drive towards things like zero rating, there is still um, a significant challenge for for many users to be able to get access. And uh, it's a comment from uh, Richard Gevers um, in the, the Q&A section. Um, he says, in terms of universal access to the internet, should Civitech be focused on advocacy and direct interventions to get broad access and connectivity? Or should we be focused on taking the situation as given and innovating around it? So I, I've got some ideas about this, but I'd, I'd like to throw it over to 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 your side, um, maybe on um, to start with uh, from your side, JD. Yeah, I, I think we, we need something right now. So we can't wait uh, for, for policy change or for the, the market to, to solve it. Um, but that said, I think it's worth um, knowing what the, what, the, what the system is. Banks in South Africa are able to zero rate their, their content. Um, a few other entities are. In South Africa specifically, I think um, if there's a, an avenue around if your content is of an academic nature where universities are using it for education. Um, that's something that we're exploring. We haven't been successful yet, but um, I mean, a lot of what we're doing, there, there are university courses on that, uh, civic education, financial education, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I do think it's something to, uh, to explore and to, to utilize as far as you can. But at the same time, we, we do need to provide the the best we can thanks jd um and from your side abigail both i think <laughs> i think we need to do both and i think it depends on who you are and what your strengths are as an individual in an organization at a particular point in time you know what you could work on and i think this really speaks to the the broader point of this panel I guess I'm kind of the need to collaborate across the sector and all work on different elements to, to improve outcomes. So maybe that's a, a little bit of a cheap answer, but. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, definitely we're on, we're on the same page in terms of needing to do both as, you know, also as JD was saying, but I think in, in extending the, the principle behind the question to now pose to the lawyers in the room, as we start talking about um, internet access and connectivity and, digital enablement increasingly as um, something that's becoming a basic human right um, because of the services that are enabled through technology. I'd, I'd like to throw it over to our, to our, our resident lawyers or, or legal specialists, uh, Nelson and Alexander, just to give us their perspective in, in looking at that function of, of universal access and, and also how we should be approaching um, providing better access. Okay. so. Um... In Nigeria recent, uh, by the way, Nigeria is a country of over 200 million people. And recently our, our Twitter space was shut down. And, and, and Twitter in Nigeria is not just to network and, 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 sh and, and just play around. Twitter is the Nigerian civic space, is where you engage with government to call government out for accountability and transparency issues is where you, you access legal services. Many people have accessed our service through Twitter alone, more than any other network. On Twitter alone, we have over 54,000 followers. On other social networks, is quite low. So Twitter is Nigeria's civic space. And, and it was shut down recently. But, but, but Nigerian um, civic tech and, and CSO space is specialized. So for Gavel, for citizen Gavel, we are focused on the, the justice sector. But you've got other uh, CSOs or NGOs that work on physical transparency 
um, internet access. And like Abigail said, the best approach is to collaborate across. So we have collaborations with all these NGOs. And when Twitter was shut down, we had to collaborate with a particular NGO to file a suit in court in order to ensure that it's restored. And there have also been times where we've had to collaborate with other um, uh, internet focused groups to agitate or advocate for uh, digital rights in Nigeria. So um, the, the, the person that asked the question was right to say that, but NGOs are also going to become specialized and they now have partnerships to solve areas that they are not working on. So um, it would be great to have more specialized NGOs that even have tools. One of our partners have tools, they're developing tools to boycott, we are already preparing for internet shutdown. So whenever our Nigeria internet is shut down, they, we already discussing um, tools to access the internet in Nigerian space. So the, the work in that space, we provide the legal um, angle to all those issues, but we, we, it's difficult for us to really leave our core strength and do everything. So that is why we uh, that, that partnership and that advocacy um, is is done by collaboration, yeah, true collaboration. Rather, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Nelson. I think certainly you raise a point that it also speaks to um, the issue of rights around access to the internet, and that's the the role in, of of governments, firstly in providing better access to, but also their potential role in restricting access not necessarily as um, as a as a function of um, cost or or infrastructure but really uh, as a result of of political interference so i think that is that's that's also a relevant consideration especially if you're driving a, an agenda that may not be popular um and i think that's that might be an area on your side alexander that's that's that you've come across in in working with uh, with elections and and information around um, elections relating to the political landscape yeah, so interesting uh, question. Uh, in regard to digital rights, uh, I think uh, it has to be seen uh, or uh, it has to be contextual and realistic. And for example, especially most of the African states, uh, by observing uh, the Eastern African nations even, uh, we, have, uh, we have to consider what kind of resources we have and what we have been doing or delivering so far. For example, we have a shortage of power or electricity. And if you cannot fulfill uh, those things, it, whatever you do or whatever question you may ask regarding digital rights, it can't be, it catch uh, the resources that you have. So we have to consider uh, it has to be uh, country specific, it has to be contextual, and uh, yeah, we have to consider that. I understand uh, the concept of uh, digital rights are very essential and uh, necessary, especially in this uh, digital age, but we have uh, to see uh, within ourselves and uh, reflect based on that. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. I think you're also raising a point that that um, we're certainly dealing with um, in South Africa and, and uh, I think globally there's an increasing push towards the digital rights and also the protection um, of personal information as that is, is increasingly commoditized. Um, and I think on the continent, we, we are definitely lagging behind in, in any considerations or concerns around things like um, data privacy and then the enforcement of, of any legislation that might protect individuals from um, the exploitation of their own data once they start interacting on um, within digital ecosystems. Um, I think that's that's certainly going to become an increasing issue uh, as we're, we're seeing more and more migration online. 
Um, and I think also just to extend on that function of the digital divide, one of the other areas I wanted to to pose as a question um, was that relating to culture. So as we're we're seeing this um, this absorption into a virtual environment, um, increasingly one that is dominated by social media platforms and um, content that is um, curated and and in some many cases generated in a western context um we're starting to see an an evolution of a kind of a third level of that digital divide which speaks directly to um, um cultural exclusion and social exclusion where we're seeing less less divers diversity represented so i just wanted to pose a question to to any of the panelists and in, in what your thoughts might be around um, considering the function of culture when it comes to designing solutions and making sure that, in particular from an African context, that we're not losing the really rich diversity that um, certainly, in my opinion, is, is one of the great assets that we have um, on the continent. How do we ensure that we don't lose our cultural heritage as we're absorbed into this new digital ecosystem? that is dominated by the likes of the US or perhaps by China. Um, how do we retain our identity as we're moving into this this um, this, this digital um, world? So uh, let me reflect on that. It's a good question. So I think uh, the role of religious institutions or cultural institutions uh, are, is very instrumental here because we can introduce concepts like uh, digital sabbaths or things like that, so as to enable, especially the use uh, to reconnect and uh, see uh, living in the physical world also. So we have to think uh, through that also, just to reflect. Thanks, Alexander. Um, maybe just to throw it over to you, Abigail, in, in terms of that um, that design process, where does where does uh, that consideration of, of culture fit into the um, the the design process that preempts um, any kind of in technology or, or solution innovation? Yeah, so I think it fits really holistically throughout the process. I mean, we want to design for people as they are, not as who we think they are, as I spoke to in my presentation. And, and in our work, we do this deep diagnosis into understanding what the context is and how people engage with it in order to design any solutions. And I think any all the design disciplines, human-centered design, user design, things like that, really take users' perspectives into the into the consideration and, and something we do as well is we do a lot of user testing of our uh, design tweaks and innovation so whether that's something as simple as like an a b test on a platform or testing uh, low tech solutions in the field with users where we really want to hear people's opinions and perspectives and how these different designs might fit into their lives how we can retain that diversity um, with the with the products we're designing Great, thanks very much for that. I think for, for me and um, and we're going through a number of different design cycles currently, and I think certainly the challenge is, has been to um, acknowledge the the diversity of culture and, and heritage, um, but also not to be trapped in that um, that retrospective view of of where where people are now, where they may have been, um, but also where we are evolving to. And I think that that for me is is one of the the key challenges in developing solutions that represent the, the the diversity of the African context, and also give young people in particular a an aspirational view of of what it means to be in touch with your culture and your heritage, um, while you are evolving into this new digital world. Um, and I think really the, 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 the challenge is, is to find a way to, to consolidate those two perspectives, both the, the past that's, um, that includes our heritage, but also the future. So we're not, um, certainly from an African context, seen as um, you know, lions, rhinos, and, um, um, and mud huts, because the, you know, the future of Africa is, is most assuredly not that. Um, we want to recognize the culture and, and the heritage that we have because that's really one of the strengths that diversity um, but certainly we're we're increasingly a major player within the um, the building of digital ecosystems 
So I, I think just to to move on from the the discussion around the digital divide, um, and again with some bias on my side, as we're looking at the function of DIY, um, I wanted to pose a question around um, considering what technology solutions are available. And here in particular, we're often faced with the conundrum of, of are we assembling solutions? Are we custom building? Are we using something that's already there? So in particular, because there is a, a fairly rapid progression towards um, low and no code platforms that are accessible and easy to use um, in addition to the likes of the social media channels and, and other traditional web functions. So I wanted to get your opinion on, on what that landscape looks like and what are the tools that we could consider to accelerate that that function of doing it yourself. JD, can I throw it over to you to start? Well, sure. Um, I, so this is something I, I really want to hear more about because I'm frustrated by how few no code or low code uh, solutions I actually see. Um, and it, it's partly because of the, the space I work in. Our community is very sort of adjacent to um, a uh, to, to software developers and, and sort of the software development community in, in South Africa. Um, and it, I find it surprising how hard it is to get programmers to experiment with no code solutions. They really want to code. They know they have a tool, they want to use it. Um, but I mean, as someone with years of coding experience, the less I can code, the better, because that's code that I don't have to maintain. But I think something to bear in mind is that um, no code solutions generally have an element of vendor lock-in, which, which scares me quite a lot. Uh, we use a platform called Webflow for, um, for building a lot of uh, websites. It, it has uh, content management functionality so you can quickly assemble a website that the the client can then maintain the content on which is incredible because the designer is using something like his design tool that we, he would normally use and boom you have a functional website uh, the problem is that that website is now um it, it's it's on that platform it's stuck on that platform and you don't just take it away and, and move it to another provider and you see the same thing with a lot of these other um, uh, no code solutions. So, so that's something that, that I think we should watch out for. But at the same time, I think the hardest thing on a lot of projects is figuring out what, the, what you should actually be doing. And no code and low code is incredible for that. So that you don't get bogged down in trying to get code to work, which can get really, really tr tricky. You, you can spend your time figuring out what the issue is and what the solution is, what the, 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 the fitting solution is. And once you've kind of figured that out, turning that into code that is open source, that is reusable, is a relatively easy problem, actually. Thanks, JD. Just to any of the other panelists, if you had any, any opinions around. Well, Go ahead, so, Yeah, thank you. As regards low code solution, I, I believe there are so many platforms that it use um is low code and no code solution, and that people should really never. Google is a very big platform. There are so many tools on Google that people could leverage on and use it. I I I, I would always reference NSAS because it was a major milestone for us here in Nigeria, and we had to use a lot of low code and no code solution. And even COVID nineteen, that no one of us, um, none of us pre prepared for. We had to use a lot of um, low and no code solution because we we need we needed to respond um, promptly to those challenges. Um, from 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 COVID nineteen to NSAS, many of these uh, platforms became popular. Google Forms. Uh, um, um google meet and, and and some of all these platforms that can, can um people can use but of course there's also many of these african enabled platforms that people can easily leverage on and and, and build on, on on there people just have to to research nowadays and, and you're able to leverage on many of these platforms to to sort to sort this sorting out yourself. So uh, really speaking about DIY applicants, 
I, I don't think at times we, we need to do that from scratch because labor developers are not cheap. <laughs> they are getting very expensive in Africa because many of them are immigrated, you know, to people that can pay, pay them better. So you also have to match. I, I, a department in my office, I, I've got like four developers and I know how, how much it costs to, to, to maintain them. I do a bit of coding myself, but all this said, I believe that a bit of YouTube video here and there, Stack Overflow here and there, GitHub here and there. You are able to put one or two things together. So uh, YouTube is a very fantastic platform. And if you can't get it on YouTube, you definitely can get it on the likes of Uden or Udacity. So th this, this, these are platforms that people can go to get DIY solutions that they can leverage on and solve that particular uh, challenge. Thanks for that, Nelson. Um, I think just to just to throw in a question um, that's come through on the Q and A, um, and this is from I think it's Getchi, um, asking um, if the panel thinks there's a risk to pushing civic DIY in the sense of governments abdicating their responsibilities for public services and enablement. Uh, th this could be another rabbit hole itself, as far as um, governments trend towards abdicating responsibilities to civil society. I think there's a rich history in that, but I, I'll, I'll leave it over to the panel to to answer that particular question. Uh, maybe on your side, Alexander, given the, the work that you've done in supporting um, the election process, um, would you say that there is a risk of governments abdicating their responsibilities? because of the work being done in, in civic tech? Uh, not really, uh, at least uh, in our context. Uh, they even uh, need the support uh, from these local organizations. Uh, and uh, But it can be, uh, it needs uh, research and it can't be, uh, it shouldn't be a general statement, I would say. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I have. If I may, go ahead, Nelson. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I, I feel that it is a common scenario where you see the government, you know, um, up, um, abdicating their, their responsibility. It, it, for me, in, in my couple of years of working in the in the CSO space, uh, we've we've seen that happening a lot and a lot of times. Um, there, have, there have been times that we just have to take on, on that you know, responsibility because also we, we will if we don't. You know, the, the, there are times that you would want the government, you want to force the government to work. There, there was a particular suit I filed some time ago. It was a strategic litigation to really force the government to work and do something about pretrial detention in Nigeria. But at the end of it, you see that you have to come back to be the one to help the government to fix that solution, uh, fix that challenge. And, and that, was, that was what came about Justice Club. Because when we sued, they just came to court trying to defend and defend. And the judiciary was not helpful. The court was telling me, ah, Nelson, do you want me to release over 100 inmates that are awaiting trial because the government have not done the need for? But I was like, yeah, because the government shouldn't just charge people and uh, remand people in prison without proper um, charges and uh, without proper evidence. You can't just keep people behind the bars without doing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's very difficult. Uh, okay, go and meet them, see how you guys can work together. And, 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 so, and so, so you, you become constrained at times. Yeah. Because also the, 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 the public sector is not attractive really mm. for people, for creative minds to work in. So the creative minds are probably in the private sector. Mm. So for uh, the broadly sector inherently has buro bureaucracy, uh, and bureaucracy are tied the hands of the government to really respond to issues. So it takes the private sector to come in and say that or uh, that creativity that swift response, that energetic spirit 
to, to solve those challenges. Because yeah. the, the, the government, for me, it seems like a big elephant that is very difficult for him or her to turn around. You know, yeah. but, but for private sector, they are more or less like the, the monkey that can turn, you know, jump up and down easily. There's a lot and, more agility. Yeah. To go, yeah. To go, to go. yeah I, I think it's, Thanks, Nelson. I think it does come back to one of the points that we had made earlier, um, and certainly I think one that um, that that Richard had raised in, in terms of navigating um, the issue of connectivity. And I think it's it is about um, advocating for change, but um, innovating while the change is happening. So it's it's not a matter of waiting for change to happen. I think you have to continuously innovate to to navigate and adapt to the context in which we're working. Um, but I think just to just to wrap up, I see we're we're reaching the end of our time. So I just um, uh, to give the panelists uh, an opportunity to to make any closing statements or comments about um, this idea of 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 DIY in in Africa relating to um, civic tech um, and supporting the um, the environment, and perhaps just as a uh, as a point from our side, how do we collaborate better? So perhaps to start with you, Abigail. Sure, I mean, from my perspective, we would be very open to collaborating with anyone. As we spoke about before, we all bring different unique skill sets and we personally work with others to implement solutions. So if you're interested in learning more about how to use behavioral science or how to, to integrate that into your existing design processes, we'd love to, to chat more with you. And, and also I um, shared something in the, the chat box as well. That's a resource we have that shares some proven behavioral science strategies. So you could think about how you might uh, use those in, in your context as well. And the resource I shared also takes new submissions at any time. So if you have something you wanna share and post on there, please feel free to reach out too. Fantastic, thanks so much for that. Um, on your side, JD? I think uh, it's like I said at the beginning, it's it's great to, to talk to each other about what we're doing. Um, we don't necessarily need to like build one tool or run one project if we're doing the same thing it could just be effective to be talking about how we're going about solving our problems i think our context can be radically different uh, but we can always learn from from each other and learn from those differences so we should be writing about our experiences and and our our learnings as we kind of try stuff and iterate and learn and improve um, and sharing that and sometimes that might mean that we go oh okay we can actually do this once we don't have to do it twice but it isn't always wrong to, to do it twice and learn twice as much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jody. Um, Alexander? Yeah, uh, so thanks, Jason. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the uh, CTIF team and Jamfest also for uh, providing this uh, platform. Uh, these kinds of platforms would also uh, provide uh, for future aspiring even civic technologists and uh, other stakeholders to get involved in such uh, initiatives. So I would suggest like uh, for the organizing team to conduct a series of uh, events just like this one. Thank you. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Nelson. Um, yeah, on collaboration, I, I would just say, Sometimes you don't need to build from scratch. If you could leverage on APIs to plug and play your own platforms at times, you know, and and these would really save you a lot of time and you have access to data and technically an engine, an engine for your platform to 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 really run. For and I'm really talking about for, for civic tech um dev developers out there so use of api is a very fast and easy way to go on diy there are a lot of resources out there youtube is is the easiest platform for you to get uh, quick um solutions to challenges and sometimes these challenges come pretty fast and you, you just need to find a way to to, to solve that and DIY solutions, you can find them from YouTube to Udemy and different 
resource platform. Yes. Thanks so much for that, um, Nelson. Um, uh, I think there's uh, been some great insights, and I think for me, what what really stands out is the um, some of the common areas that um, and some of the common challenges that we face, um, and certainly the the opportunities that there are for for us to collaborate to solve those um, those challenges. Um, I think for for me, considering the the importance of the digital divide and the and the, the need to provide universal access, and also to guard how we're using that access, um, because without achieving um, kind of productive use of that access, we're we're gonna we're gonna waste that um, that access that we've we've been provided with, um, and then not losing our culture as we're we're migrating into this new digital world. Um, also on the, the issue of, of low and no code platforms that can help to accelerate um, the function of DIY. Um, as JD said, there, there, are lots of, there are lots of platforms available, um, but just to be aware of some of the, some of the hooks that go with those platforms, um, nothing is, is ever fully free. Um, it just depends on what it's gonna cost you in terms of time, money or pain and suffering. So just to consider that when it comes to low and no code options. And then I think finally, really, I think an, an overarching theme, certainly one that speaks to the value of this conference is the need for, for more collaboration. I think the ability to share resources. Um, I love the idea of, of um, um, an, an API library or um, an API collaboration, where in particular, we can start to consolidate not only capability, um, and functionality, but also data, um, because ultimately I think data and visibility is what's going to allow us to do um, better work faster and, um, and on a broader scale. So thanks for that, Nelson. Certainly a, a great initiative. We look forward to your next platform. That is the the, the API sharing platform for, for African civic tech uh, businesses and organizations. Um, and then just in closing, I'd like to thank all of the all of the participants on the panel for your time and for um, providing your your insights to us. Um, I'd like to thank all of the all of the attendees for for joining us in this session. Um, I think good to um, uh, attend the other sessions that are scheduled for the rest of the conference and certainly to to join in the the hangout session at five o'clock. Um, I think that there's uh, there's a daily virtual hangout session that I think the the team is busy putting up now um, on the screen. So please feel free to join us um, on that virtual exhibition and also to engage further with some of the uh, the civic tech media and, and invaders. Um, so looking at uh, the session for tomorrow, um, the teams just put up a view of uh, what's what's going to be happening in the conference tomorrow. So just to again to invite everyone to. Um, attend the rest of the sessions that we have scheduled for for tomorrow. So that's all we have uh, time for today. I'm sure there's lots more that we could talk about. Um, certainly, it's been a great session for me. Um, um, I'm certainly going to going to stalk all of the panelists and get in touch on the the, the social media platforms and 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 follow up to see where we can um, drive that agenda of collaboration and working together. But thanks again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the other sessions on the conference. All the best. Um, there's no sound, Sifia. Um, just letting you know. Power to the innovators, the DIYers across the continent. Power to you who push the doors wide open. Power but to you who've planted good seed on fertile African ground. We celebrate you. Thank you for joining us. Visit our websites and social media platforms to continue the conversation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
session now see you later thanks everyone take care